This is Cape Elizabeth Church of the Nazarene. We invite you to stand together as we worship God for his worthy. Thank him for his kindness and his salvation today. morning and welcome. We are glad that you are here today to worship. This is our time to honor the Lord for he has been good to us and to be able to praise him. Uh, we are glad that you're here this morning. Uh, this morning, if I don't shake your hand, please uh, apologize, but you probably can uh, tell that I'm just a little under the weather. But uh, we are going to nonetheless have a good time worshiping our Lord and uh, giving him the praise and honor that he is due. Uh, this week is uh, the last week of September. We, this month we have been doing an alabaster offering. Uh, uh, people have been putting uh, in this uh, church there on the altar uh, their alabaster offering, offering to help uh, support and bless uh, the missionary activity of the church in our world areas to give uh, people places of worship and service um, throughout our world. And so if you would like to give to that, uh, please do so this week as well to help us um, support uh, the gospel mission around our world. Let us hear the call to worship continue to honor our Lord this morning. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. He's, the Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. I invite you to stand together as we worship him. Amen.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to adore you this morning. Lord, uh, how wonderful indeed that uh, your Son would come and love us, be gracious to us, that you are the one who indeed has always uh, been watching out for us. You are the one who created this world. You are the one who guided your people. You are the one who has been with us. And you sent your Son uh, to be with us, to, whose spirit would live with us, and to come again and fully restore your creation to its purposes that you have had to uh, be forever in your presence. And so, Lord, today we are in awe of you. And, Lord, uh, we just praise you this morning. Thank you again for... Uh, the opportunity we have just to come and honor you and praise you and say, Lord, you are the King of Kings. You are my everything. And so, uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, we would uh, feel you close to us this morning and know without a doubt that you have a plan and a purpose and a direction for us. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would help speak to our spirits and let us know that uh, uh, we can be in the center of your will. And that, uh, Lord, I just pray that that would be a part of our prayer Lord, uh, help us be in the center of your will. Help us, Heavenly Father, each day say, Lord, how can I honor and glorify you with the way that I work, with the way that I um, uh, engage with my neighbors, with, in the way that I live my life. Lord, how can I be in the center of your will? And so, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of worship again. I just pray that uh, we would draw closer to you, and uh, Lord, you would be honored by uh, what we offer today in worship. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our ushers are going to come forward and they're going to receive our tithes and offers away, offerings away for us to say thank you again to our Lord in a very tangible way. Ushers, please come forward. our scripture lessons today. And of course I left my glasses back so well, but I can do it. And the reading today is from Amos 6, 1a, and then on and I'm going to get my Apologies again. The reading today is from Amos 6, 1a, and then 4 through 6. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, those who feel, those of you, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. You lie in beds inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise in musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and you use finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Praise God for his name. Our second re reading comes uh, from. First Timothy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. And we see here entitlements of love of money and Paul's charge to uh, Timothy. 
starting with verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and we take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people are eager for money, have wandered from the faith, and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith and take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you were made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything and to Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, for which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to be put their hope in wealth, which is uh, so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. God's word for God's people. Amen. I invite you to stand together as we sing our hymn this morning. for you today from Luke chapter uh, 16. Uh, we've kind of been uh, spending a little bit of time in Luke. Uh, we did last week and uh, just going through some stories of Jesus. And uh, 
Uh, Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 19. This is, a, this is a story that Jesus is telling, a parable, if you will. And uh, so we want to uh, read this in light of it uh, being a story. Uh, when we read a story or hear a parable of Jesus, what we're looking for is, is the point that he's trying to make. And sometimes we can extrapolate way too much out of a story, but we want to look at what is it that Jesus is saying for us and how is it that God wants to uh, change us in light of this story. So let's, let's hear this. Uh, Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 19. It says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat whatever fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and he was buried and in hell where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This is the story. Uh, this, this, this story of this, this rich man who um, has a beggar outside of his street, uh, uh, outside of his uh, home, the gate to his home. He, he, he walks by him and passes him. It makes me wonder. It doesn't say much about his character. Is he like what Amos was describing, the prophet Amos was describing, in terms of how much preference he gave to uh, his own wealth? Uh, he, he walks by him again and again, leaving him to himself. Uh, I, I can almost imagine the kind of thoughts that he might have had walking by these people. They're the, they're the kind of thoughts I have heard uh, verbalized time and time again. Maybe he looked at Lazarus and, and thought, oh, him again, why is he here? Well, I can't give him money. He would probably just blow it on who knows what and take who knows what if I gave him money. He probably walked by and thought, well, why doesn't this guy just get a job? Probably walked by, thought any number of things about this man, but one thing he knew, there was no way he was getting a penny from him. No one was having any compassion on Lazarus at all. Uh, he was stuck, and he, he was someone who, who having uh, not received aid and, and laying all the time out, uh, out on the road, he had developed these sores from whether it's poor health or from laying and being unable to move. There he was, covered in his sores. We, I had my uh, uncle live with us when I was in high school for a couple of years, and he had this condition where uh, when it got cold out, his skin just tr dried up. Uh, and it would get pink and it would get raw and uh, his shins started to get cracked and uh, they would start to bleed. And I remember one time his dog who was there just sitting there licking his legs and I went to him and I said, do you like it that your dog is doing that? Because his, his legs were just raw and sore. And I said, that just, that just seemed weird and gross to me. And uh, he said, well, you know, it feels good enough and removes the itch. And the dog wants to uh, give me comfort. And, and there, the, him and his dog had that relationship where uh, the dog knew he was in discomfort, would do whatever he could, and he would let him uh, do that. This man on the side of the road... The only comfort he gets, the only compassion he gets, the only connection he has with anyone is with wild dogs. The dogs walking by who look at him and have more compassion on him than a fellow human being. This is the scene that we come to. And then the story fast forwards. And the, fa and the scene fast forwards to, to their death. 
uh, to when both of them have died. It doesn't tell us why, but of course that's the nature of a story, right? As you can just, you can just fast forward to the end scene. And, and it has them in, in an afterlife kind of moment. And uh, it doesn't tell us why particularly that uh, um, Lazarus is standing next to Father Abraham in, in heaven and why this rich man is not. But, um, I, I mean, usually when we talk about heaven and we talk about hell, we talk about what people believe or what people know or, or how someone has lived for God. In this story, the story is just based purely on this picture. And, 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 when, I, and when we look at that, that then means that when we see the people God puts before us in our life and we see the have-nots, uh, we need to recognize from the, the, uh, from, from the opening of this story that God is someone whose love and compassion extends to the have-nots, extends to those who have nothing. The, the good news about this is it means that it doesn't matter where we find ourselves in our life, whether we find ourselves in a spot where we, we can no longer contribute the way that we used to contribute. We can no longer give ourselves over to God the way we used to be able to give ourselves over to God. Or we find ourselves in, in a dark place or a spot where it seems like nobody is willing to help or assist. If we ever find ourselves in, in those shoes, the good news from at least the opening of this story is this, that God does not overlook us that God still loves us and is willing to welcome us into his family. This is the story for Lazarus. And for the rich man who finds himself in hell, I would expect that it would have said something more about his character or would have said something more about his rejection of God. But instead, the only rejection we see is his rejection of somebody in need, which means that we are indeed supposed to love our neighbor as ourself that when Jesus listed that as one of the commandments, that he was pretty serious about that, that that is indeed an extension of and just as important as loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so in this story, in this illustration of what it's like, uh, uh, it says that uh, he has uh, been thrown, thrown in hell. The Greek word for hell is, um, uh, is Gehenna, and it, it is... Um, uh, it, is, it is a word that has always kind of been a reference to a, a valley, uh, a valley where they would throw their trash. And so this is a picture in many ways of the man who had discarded, had thrown aside, had ignored uh, this Lazarus person, has now in a very similar way, it, he is now in a place where he is discarded. And that valley of trash would have been burned, uh, where the trash would have uh, uh, been on fire, and it would have continued to burn and smolder and always kind of going. And so that is the image of hell that uh, Jesus is borrowing from, that this person who had discarded another has in many ways himself finds himself discarded. And, but but he, he, he calls out of this chasm, out of this valley, if you will, he calls up because he sees some people looking over. And he recognizes one is the figure of Father Abraham. This is, this is the figure of faith. This is the one who followed God, who God revealed himself to and said, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. Your, your children will be as numerous as the stars. And I'm going to guide them and lead them. And he says, please, please, just a little bit of comfort. And this is showing that um, uh, how we live in, our, in this life does indeed matter, that it matters to God. And then he says, but what about those who, who could still find out, who could still know? He says, w w would you go warn them? Would you do whatever you could just, just to let them know that uh, they do not want to be discarded as I had discarded Lazarus? And Abraham says, they have God's word. They have the words God has spoken to His people about how we're to treat one another. The, the law of Moses and the prophets tells us uh, to treat those have-nots with love and respect. It tells us how to treat the orphan, how to treat the widow. It tells us how to treat the poor. It tells us how to treat the immigrant. It tells us how to treat those who are displaced. It tells us how to treat those who have nothing and nothing to offer that there is a God who called out a people just like that out of slavery and said, I have something 
for you. That we would not forget those roots and say that we might find people who similarly are stuck in a spot where they have nothing left and nothing left to offer, but yet God has said, I have not forgotten you. And then he says, uh, he says to them, hey, have them to listen to. And he thinks, you know what? Some miracles people just can't ignore, right? Some miracles, you see that happen and you know without a doubt God did something. I had a lady in my last church uh, when I was pastoring in Arkansas. She had, uh, she had been diagnosed uh, with uh, pancreatic cancer, which is like the worst. It is fast moving. It is always deadly. Always, always, always. And she went to see the doctor one time, and uh, she said, yeah, back in this year, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And the doctor looked at her and said, are you kidding me? How are you still alive if you were diagnosed with pancreatic cancer? Because this was many, 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 many years later. And he says, what kind of quack doctor told you you had pancreatic cancer? Because no one lives that long with, with, with that. And she gave the name of the doctor, and he looked at the, at, at the sign naming uh, uh, the sign for the name of the wing of the hospital because that doctor's name, uh, he, he was so prominent and influential there that that wing had actually been named after him. And he's like, oh, okay, well, let me take another look at your records now. But she had, but in, for whatever reason in her life, in that moment, uh, a miracle had happened and God had extended her life and somehow brought what never goes into remission into a kind of remission. And so here, uh, here she was, and, and like this is a miracle moment. And sometimes in miracle moments, the thought is, well, surely if there's something that cannot be described that goes against everything that we know and believe, that this must be a moment that uh, someone without a doubt will say, oh, I get it. I see it now. I once had a guy tell me, he said, um, oh man, I remember I was in, I was in high school. This, this could be a long story, but I'm going to shorten it. There was a guy in high school who was telling me why I believed in God. He was asking these questions, and I would come back, and, and uh, I, was, I was a new Christian, so I don't know. Sometimes I'd go home, and I'd, ask, I'd call my youth pastor, and then I'd come back to school, and we'd talk some more. And he said to me, he said, well, could you just ask God to do something miraculous? Why don't you just ask God to do something right now, somewhat miraculous, something that's just out of the ordinary, and then I'll, and, and then I'll believe. And I said, what? Like, like what? He's like, I don't know. Like, we're kids, right? We're in high school. He's like, I don't know. Have him make the lights flicker or something. And I was like, the lights flicker? And I said to him, I don't know why this came out. I said to him, I said, so you're telling me if I pray to God right now and he makes the lights flicker that you believe? He said, yeah, yeah, I'll believe. Just, just do that. And I said, and when you believe and you start changing your life and following God and you go home and you tell your parents why you're doing that and you tell them because the lights flickered, I said, do you think they'll buy that? I said, and when you grow up and you have kids and, you tell, and, and your kids ask you why you believe in God and you tell them because the lights flickered in high school, you, you, you think that'll be good enough for them? I said, the biggest miracle of all happened. Jesus came back from the dead, and we've been telling our children ever since. Ever since, we've been telling them of the biggest miracle one could ever encounter. That the God who walked among us, who was rejected and died, I wasn't this eloquent at that point in time, um, uh, died and rose again, and, uh, and, and, and we have been telling that story ever since, and that is the greatest miracle that God could ever present before us. And that is the story we are telling. And it is going to be way more believable, way more convicting, and way more life-changing than, well, you know, what? something small that was unexplainable just happened to happen at just the right time. And so this is what he says to um, uh, this. So he calls on and says, uh, if you just go back, from the dead, and you tell them, they'll see that miracle and they'll know. Folks, here, here we are. This story that Jesus tells that is recorded for us for all of history. I imagine Luke remembering this story that Jesus told, this illustration he told. And as he records it for the church, he says, but Jesus did come back from the dead. 
And here we are, and this is the story. This is the second chance we all have. This is the second chance to say that God actually has an interest in how we treat one another and how we love one another. God actually has an interest that, that maybe the way we live this world uh, matters. That, that what happens in this story is the way this world operates is, is turned on its head. It's flipped upside down. The one with power has none. The one with influence has none. The one who had nothing now has everything and to live our life recognizing that there is a God who has created this world and even though this world has started to kind of spin out of control and, and, and totally go away from God for us to say but that is not normal the normal is the calling God has put on his creation to live for him and to love for him and that is our calling and there is indeed someone who rose from the dead the greatest miracle of all that shows us this sign and then the question is this are we convinced? Have we recognized that God has indeed done something for us and compelled us to live for Him and to love boldly one another, to give boldly? This story is a story that invites us into His shoes and actually into the shoes of the rich, uh, the rich man. I, I, I can point to moments in my life where, um, uh, where I, I was a lot like this rich man. There are moments in my life I'm not proud of where I think uh, perhaps I could have been more gracious to that person who was in need or that person who needed help. But for whatever reason, I acted like uh, one of the three people who walked by uh, the man who was beaten by robbers because I was in a hurry or I had something else to do. But I had a moment where I could have shared grace and, I, and, and my prayer and my hope is that uh, through learning from that and, ha and, uh, and, and having my faith developed, that God will be gracious and forgiving. And it is my encouragement to me that in this story, that God says the one who has nothing is the one who still has God. And even when we don't get things right, and even when we have nothing going for us, God is still with us. One of the things I love about church, uh, particularly when something doesn't go right, uh, as much as uh, we will take seriously our worship for God, I love that we can still laugh when something just doesn't quite go right. Uh, whether it's something as, as small as, oops, I forgot my glasses, or something a little bit bigger where someone just, you know, uh, uh, messes up something in, entirely. I like to laugh at that and be among people who can laugh at that because it's just our humanity coming through, right? In, in small little ways, just our humanity coming through and worship and recognize, here we are, God, this is, this is me with, with, with flubs, mistakes, and, and all that kind of stuff as well. And as we go from this place in our life too, we are going to encounter that as well, where we continue to have flubs and mistakes and sometimes oftentimes perhaps we have, we have moments of rejection and sin as well but yet there is a God as we continue to turn towards him ask for forgiveness and try to follow him there is a God who is forgiving and even if we find ourselves in a spot where we have nothing left to offer there is a God who has said I have not overlooked you and I have a place for you and while we are here we, we have somebody who came back from the dead and said, this God who raises the one who is utterly despised, raises the one who is utterly rejected, tossed aside, put up on a tree like a curse, absolutely thrown aside, God raises him from the dead and he raises up everyone like that from the dead, like Jesus, like Lazarus, like us when that is us. And that is a call for us to uh, learn to live anew with compassion and grace and also to take hold of uh, the hope and the promise that God has for all of us. That despite, uh, sometimes despite who we are or what we've done, God still loves us and desires to be with us. That is the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is our hope and that is our gospel. And it's my hope this morning that uh, we will live out that grace and uh, whatever blessings that God has given us, that we will learn again to continue to bless those whom God has brought before us.
Let's uh, indeed ask the Lord to uh, direct us, to help us be the kind of people who will serve and love one another. Let's sing this song, Make Me a Servant, as we go to prayer and then communion and uh, bring ourselves before the Lord. Let's sing this prayer chorus. You can stand if you wish. Use this song to help you pray. Heavenly Father, uh, uh, we, we come to you today just, uh, Lord, asking, Lord, how can we be faithful to the grace that you have given us? How can we continue to uh, look in this world and see that you are the God who is still at work? And that, Lord, may we remember that you are the God who leads people even when they had nothing, when they were lost, enslaved to sin or enslaved to their past, you lead them out to the promised land. And Lord, when we find that we have indeed been thoroughly blessed by you, may Lord, we never forget that uh, you are the God who is still guiding and leading people. And Lord, if you give us the opportunity to be able to share that graciousness and that gift, Lord, help us to be faithful to that. Heavenly Father, today we are humbled to come before you, knowing that uh, you are the God who loves us where we are. And uh, Lord, you are the one who offers forgiveness, if that is what we need. And uh, Heavenly Father, I just pray that uh, you would indeed reach out with your grace and uh, speak to our hearts that indeed we are your children and you have a purpose and a plan for us. Help us, Lord, know that we can be wrapped up into the promise of eternal life. And while we are here, we can live out that faithfulness. We can live out that graciousness. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we'll receive uh, the elements of, for uh, Holy Communion. Feel, feel free to come forward and receive these elements of God's grace.
Uh, this sacrament is a symbol and sign of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us and for our behalf. Remember the night on which he was betrayed that uh, he sat with his disciples at the Last Supper. And after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body. It's broken for you. So let's take this and eat this in remembrance and be thankful. Similarly, after giving thanks, he took the cup, lifting it to heaven, said, this is my blood which is poured out for you. Take and drink this in remembrance and be thankful. Sing that closing hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And of course, we're going to stand to sing this. Christ, who came back from the dead and offer us hope and a future, go with us. May we share that grace and that hope with the world around us. Amen.